of the things that happened this week was that we lost Dorothy Fontana. Star, the, Star Trek, the original series, had a lot of contributors, both in terms of world building that universe and also in writing some of the best stories. Now, Gene Roddenberry, as the creator and executive producer of the show, and we'd really call him more like a showrunner today, um, generally liked to take all of the credit for everything that ever went on with Star Trek. Um, that was really kind of unfair. Um, it, it certainly as a showrunner, he had the final say on anything that went before the cameras. And he was very hands-on, very hands-on producer, often doing <laughs> last-minute reviews or rewrites and stories, much to the chagrin of his writing and story editing staff. Um, Roddenberry was um, uh, hands-on um, so that he managed to alienate Harlan Ellison, who is one of the biggest names in science fiction ever and probably one of the best authors to ever live, period. Roddenberry rewrote Harlan, episodes, Harlan uh, Ellison's episode, The City on the Edge of Forever. Now, this is considered generally one of the best, if not the best, Star Trek episodes in any um, our incarnation. Now, if you're a younger fan and you have some difficulty connecting with the original series because the tech looks so outdated, hey, I understand. But please watch The City on the Edge of Forever. It is a period piece that's set in the 1930s, so there's not that much check around to kind of go, what the hell, you know. It also chronicles one of the most heartbreaking events in James Kirk's life in a very amazing story. Larry Larry says, DC Fontana was two of the three Star Trek creators and writers with the two genes. Yes, I, I agree with you on that. I'm going to talk about that in a bit, too. But yes, I totally agree with you that she was, of those three people, she was, you know, like right next to Jean Kuhn in terms of what she brought to the table. Anyway, with regards to City on the Edge Forever, it is um, not exactly on film the story that was turned in by Ellison. Um, the original script is, in fact, um, better in many ways, it's superior, but what made Harlan Ellison this angry, and so much so that he detested both Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek, all the way, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying literally in some figurative sense, I mean literally, he went to the grave hating Roddenberry and Star Trek. Well, Roddenberry had told Ellison that he could do all the rewrites on the episode. Now, Ellison was capable of doing this, um, although some of the times the rewrites that he was told to do, he did under somewhat vehement protest. Um, the filmed ending angered Ellison quite a lot. Now, I'm not going to spoil this for you. you. haven't seen the episode. But the original script showed Kirk doing something that we might consider that's inside of his character, but that Roddenberry thought was wrong for the hero of a show to do. So, for a variety of reasons, and I've heard differing um, accounts and have really no idea which one to believe, the script was ultimately taken out of Ellis's hands and rewritten by the regular writing staff. Uh, Larry Larry says, Harlan hated TV in general. Oh, yeah, yeah, he hated. There was a long list of things that Harlan hated, and he wouldn't um, mind telling you about it at length if given the chance. Um, but, yeah, he generally hated TV. He got really, really disillusioned with it after the star lost. If you've ever seen that, last I knew all the episodes were on YouTube, probably in violation of copyright. But they were all here. I've got copies of them. It's a TV show that he was supposed to make basically where he was going to be the showrunner. And he was coming up with this kind of big plot idea with an arc, you know, like you wouldn't have seen. It was the 1970s. You wouldn't have seen arcs, you know, ARC for a story at that time, really. So he was coming up with this big arcs and all this stuff he was doing. And, and then... It all just went completely down the toilet in a way that is damn near inexplicable. Um, suffice to say that what made it to TV sucked. It really sucked. It's terrible. And uh, yeah, Harlan, I mean, he was, never, he was never that thrilled with TV, although he did like doing um, things like Outer Limits. Um, he did like doing stuff like that, but he was given a lot of creative freedom on those shows, you know. He didn't have to, on, on the Outer Limits, he didn't have to worry about fitting this into a larger context as an anthology show. So. But he didn't mind doing that. Um, arc with arcs, yes, exactly, you, you know, the star lost, yeah. Um, so anyhow, he, he got very, very turned off after star lost. It's terrible. But in any case, the city on the edge of forever, it went through a lot of hands. There are moments when it gets preachy, and you can see that that's got Gene Roddenberry's mark on. Um, there are some also very tender moments that don't appear in the original. 
And these did not originate from Roddenberry's hands. You know, in all reality, if you look at the episodes with which Roddenberry is the sole writer, and in particular, if you look at Star Trek The Motion Picture, which I'm going to talk about later, Roddenberry wasn't himself a great writer. He was a great ideas man, and he was a decent enough rewriter, but he was, he was preachy, really, really preachy. The number of writers who contributed to Sitting on the Edge of Forever is probably lost to time. If uh, you know the series as well as I do, and if you've read the original script by Ellison that I have, then you can see that the best of the episode it tends to remain intact. Um, it's just that there are clearly other hands than Harlan Ellison's on this script. Now keep in mind, for a moment, Harlan, because I'm going to come back to Dorothy Fontana, Harlan Ellison was friends with Dorothy Fontana which is how we bring this back to her. Remember this, Harlan Ellison and Dorothy Fontana were friends. Dorothy C. Fontana was born on March 25th, 1939 and passed away just a few days ago on December 2nd, 2019. Dorothy had gone to Hollywood in the uh, early 1960s and began in the industry as a secretary. And in fact, she began on Star Trek as an assistant under Gene Roddenberry. Larry Larry says, Roddenberry wrote for Have Gun, Will Travel. Yeah, you know what? All of his episodes were on YouTube at one point. I think I pulled them down. But yeah, any of the ones for Have Gun, Will Travel that, has, that were, had his name on it, I actually pulled down. They're not bad. They're not bad. You know, they're not anything that's going to win any Emmy Awards, but they're not bad. You know, they're not, not quite as preachy as, as Roddenberry got with Star Trek. But, so... Dorothy Fontana starts out kind of, you know, administrative side of things, but she was a great writer. She was a really good writer. Fantastic in some ways I'm going to talk about. By the time she was working on Star Trek, she already had a number of scripts and different TV shows under her belt, and so recognizing this obvious talent that he had here, Roddenberry made her the series story editor, which meant that she worked with freelance writers because that's what they largely used on those shows, and she rewrote scripts as it, they needed to be rewritten, and that happens a lot. Not just that they necessarily need to be rewritten uh, dramatically, but particularly with Star Trek, it would be rewriting them so that they would fall into line of Gene Roddenberry's philosophy, you know, optimism. So. One thing that Dorothy really handled particularly well was Spock, his parents, and Vulcan civilization in general. Now, she did two seminal episodes, one for the original series and one for the animated series, that delve very deeply into the relationship between Spock, his parents, and Vulcans in general. The episode that she did for the original series was Journey to Babel. It's an excellent ex episode and lays out everything that we now take completely for granted with regards to Spock, his father Sarek, and his mother Amanda. All of the pablum that you see on Star Trek Discovery is ripping off what Dorothy Fontana did in 1967, except that Dorothy did a hell of a lot better at it. She understood the Vulcans, and in particular the character of Spock. She wrote Spock so well that in my dedication, as I went back and redid, I think she gave Spock his soul, and I mean that. While many other writers would do this character over the last 53 years, no one really has written Spock as elegantly nor as poignantly. Not Roddenberry, not writers for movies, and certainly not the hack frauds who are writing for Star Trek Discovery. Go watch Journey to Babel. If you're a young fan, I just ask that you attempt to look past the dated tech and look at the story yourself. If you look at the story, your heart is going to love you for the rest of your life. Larry Larry says, DC Fontana met Roddenberry on uh, one season uh, TV show, The Lieutenant. Yes, there was a TV show that Roddenberry produced prior to Star Trek called The Lieutenant. It was about a uh, lieutenant in the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, and, uh, yeah, she met Roddenberry while he was working on that, yeah. Which is why it was a natural thing to come for her to come over to Star Trek with him. So Dorothy's early career was not without challenges. In the 1950s and 1960s, TV and the film industry was almost 100% dominated by men. If you saw a woman, they were usually secretaries or stenographers or oftentimes in Roddenberry's case, a mistress. <laughs> to appoint Dorothy to the uh, original series uh, story editor position was really rather progressive at the time. 
And in fact, when Dorothy first started out, she had trouble selling her scripts to TV series, particularly with things like westerns and cop shows. Producers would just reject her script totally unread because they just didn't believe that a woman could write that kind of a show. So she took to submitting her scripts under the name D.C. Fontana, and that's how it always appears in the credits, even in the original series. Producers would then assume that this initials were a man's name, and so they'd read the script, it would be really good, and only then would they discover that it had been written by a woman. But by then, of course, they're completely hooked because it's a good story. So Dorothy probably opened a lot of doors for women in Hollywood. I don't know how we can quantify that, but she was the first on a lot of this stuff. Yep, Larry, Larry says she started out as a secretary but wrote under D.C. to hide her gender. Exactly. So she had uh, um, her hands on a lot of Star Trek episodes. I mean, the story editor, her work just required it. Sometimes she wrote scripts of her own. Sometimes she brainstormed with other writers and they might take off with an idea. And sometimes she just rewrote the script that needed work. So as I mentioned, Gene Roddenberry was extremely hands-on with Star Trek, the original series. He was not the only person who contributed to it. And as Larry Larry mentioned, there are basically three people. Gene Kuhn, who was a producer and writer on the show, and I will talk about him someday, it's not the day for it, and Dorothy Fontana. And you want to know how good Dorothy was much, much later, she was very briefly on Star Trek The Next Generation. And in the very first episode, Encounter at Farpoint, this is clearly a Gene Roddenberry script. It is preachy. It has a godlike alien, which fortunately, I think largely due to uh, his portrayal, went on to become one of the most memorable characters of that series. But Encounter in Farpoint is clearly just Roddenberry. It is the sort of thing he likes to write. However, there is a very beautiful little scene that takes place between Data and a very old Dr. McCoy. And it rather sticks out. If you're familiar with the way Roddenberry writes, that scene just sticks out at you because it's so totally different than the way he'd do anything. Turns out Dorothy wrote that scene. <laughs> if she'd done the entire episode, or at least rewritten Roddenberry, it might not be, have been as preachy. Um, yeah, she was in writing Next Generation 2, Larry Larry says. Yes, she was. She wrote Next Gen for a while. There were a number of people who came over from the original series that worked on Next Gen for a while. And apparently, I don't know for sure the story behind this, but everything I've been told says to me that at some point, Roddenberry's lawyer started getting involved in production. And that screwed up relationships between Roddenberry and uh, Dorothy Fontana, screwed up things between Roddenberry and uh, David Gerald. Um, so there was a lot of turnover that first year in Star Trek The Next Generation, not just from older Star Trek people, but also from just people who couldn't deal with what the hell was going on over there. Yep, Larry Larry says she knew Dr. McCoy. She knows all of them. Um, I credit her a lot with Spock, but she was just a damn good writer. So in any case, she was on the original series. She was the story editor. She rewrote a lot of stories. Now, you remember Harlan Ellison detested Roddenberry in Star Trek literally until he died. And how he thought that Roddenberry had completely destroyed the episode with Roddenberry's rewrite. And so they knew that. Um, but he, remember, he was friends. He was friends with Dorothy Fontana, hated Roddenberry for the rest of his entire life. Well, it turns out that a very late version draft or a final draft of the script, I'm not sure which and I'm not sure anybody knows, of that shooting script had actually been rewritten by Dorothy Fontana. So for 20 years, everybody involved with Star Trek kept that particular secret because they knew if it got out, her friendship with, with Harlan would just be over. Harlan was well known for just, you screw with me, I'm done with you, you know. So they kept that secret for over 20 years. It was only in 1988 when Ellison wrote a book about making of City on the Edge of Forever that Dorothy finally confided the truth in him. Fortunately, by that time, their long friendship um, had allowed Ellison to kind of get past this with only a very large dropping of, dropping of his jaw on his part. <laughs> so after Star Trek, Dorothy did freelance writing for other shows as well as staff writing jobs. Um, she did a lot of fair amount of science fiction, probably due to her Star Trek reputation. She returned to Star Trek to serve as an associate producer on the animated series in the early 1970s. This is undoubtedly one of the reasons that the animated series stories are so good. 
Now, I know to a lot of modern people uh, used to modern animation, it is really tough sometimes to sit through Star Trek, the animated series. But a few things you need to understand, as I always do, I try to set the stage culturally. Almost no one took animation seriously at that time. It was considered uh, just cartoons for kids. Um, it was oftentimes, it oftentimes just was cartoon for kids. There wasn't a lot of animation out there. Uh, you know, I was a child in the 1970s when this was produced, and I can tell you that Basically, there were syndicated cartoons that showed it maybe before or after school for a while, and then everything else was on Saturday morning. Saturday morning was when all these new shows, generally animated, would then air. And the three networks, they each had, because there was only three networks, four if you counted PBS, but nobody did on Saturday morning. So there's only three networks, and they each had their own lineup of children's shows on Saturday mornings, and the kid would just sit there and slip, flip the dial as you know the half hour ended, and they wanted to get onto the other network for their new show. Saturday morning was also considered really a dumping ground, um, beyond some pretty limited some limited rules about what you could do showing kids and you know stuff on on Saturday mornings. They really didn't care. Um, what was on the air. If it was good in the ratings, then it aired. That was really all they had. They didn't put much money into it, and this meant that the animation of that era, <clears throat> which, remember, was dependent on hand-painted illustrations that changed very minutely from one frame to the next. So that's painstaking work, and so they had to cut corners um, because they didn't have the money. They had to cut corners. They cut a lot of corners, but no more so than anybody else in the early 1970s, mid-1970s. They, they were cutting exactly the same corners as everybody else. But that is why uh, the animated series seems as crude as it does. However, what Star Trek the Animated Series did was outshone everything else on Saturday morning it was their stories. And I urge you, I, I, you know, to watch and attempt to put this limited animation behind you because in animated series, like any show, has a hit and miss ratio. Some of them are good, some of them aren't so good, some of them just outright suck. Um, it's, it's the Sturgeon's Law in action. 90% of science fiction is crap, um, which the corollary to which is 90% of everything is crap. Uh, but the hit and miss ratio on Star Trek the Animated Series is pretty high. And um, the stories are good in here because of the people who are involved in writing, story editing, and producing that show. At the top of that list for Star Trek the Animated Series was Dorothy Fontana. Apparently, Roddenberry wasn't all that terribly interested in this project, other than being true to this general philosophy of optimism that the show always had. And Dorothy was then just left to do the heavy lifting. And the stories produced for this show tell the tale about how she did that lifting. You know, if Paramount, and we said so at the time, had had any brains whatsoever, they'd have thrown a lot more money into the animation and then put the show on prime freaking time. Um, the scripts were just that much better than everything else on Saturday morning. I, you know, I, I, after he did animated series, um, David Gerald, who wrote The Trouble with Tribbles from the original Star Trek series, went over and basically show ran Land of the Lost. That was as close as you were going to get. Those stories are as close as you're going to get to what came on Star Trek, the animated series. Now, <clears throat> Dorothy, uh, her best episode, in my opinion, for the animated series was called Yesteryear. It involved Spock traveling back in time to meet a younger version of himself on Vulcan. So, for the very first time... Yes, Discovery, you're ripping it off. For the very first time, we got to see some of the trials and tribulations that young Spock had endured. We saw Sarek and Amanda again with um, Mark Leonard doing the voice of Sarek for the show again. And we saw the foundations, really, what went on behind the relationship that we saw in Journey to Babel. And we learned a fair amount of new things about the Vulcan cultural in culture in general. I meant to put this on here. Um, so, for one of the things for fans, one of the biggest things was that we actually got to see Vulcan. Um, you can see it right here behind me as it was animated by the guys at Filmation who did the animation for the show. Um, what this is behind me is Shikar, um, the city where Spock grew up. The rest of the planet was animated just equally as well. Um, they spent a lot of time really on two things on that show because they knew they couldn't do the movements and stuff like that in the way that you might want to do them. So instead, they spent a lot of time on the stories 
and man, did they draw some good backgrounds. If you watch through screen caps or even the show, just watch the backgrounds. The backgrounds are extraordinary detailed compared to a lot of the animation that's going on. But there was re this was done really well. Um, it, uh, it really firmly established uh, that Vulcan is a desert environment. And it has one rather nasty predator whose name makes its way to other uh, versions of Star Trek. By the way, you hack frauds at Star Trek Discovery. Vulcan is a desert planet. There are no places on it that look like a um, small patch of trees outside of Toronto. You know, if you can't film a real desert, that's fine. A green screen and CGI are waiting for you, you morons. Larry Larry says, as you have said, Saturday morning was a dumping ground. Most artists didn't even want to have their name on anything associated on anything on Saturday morning shows. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> The guy who did the lion's share of the work for the soundtrack to Star Trek, the animated series, he did all of the, um, most, almost all of Filmation's soundtracks, period. Um, what they would do, excuse me, what they would do is we build up a library of 10 or 15 cues that they would constantly reuse over again. That's why you hear all the music, all of it, but... Um, the guy who did those, darn it, I'm not remembering his name now. He was a jazz musician. Ellis is in his name, I think. I should look it up. I don't remember his name, but uh, he didn't. Do, he wouldn't put his name on that show. He wouldn't put his name on anything that Filmation did. Um, he did his work under a pseudonym. <laughs> um, it, it, so, I mean, he's a good musician. He was a good composer. He's a well-thought-of jazz musician, but um, he would not put his name on that show for that very reason, Larry Larry. But yesterday, or yesterday rather, is um, it's a really poignant episode. Focuses on one of the most important events in Spock's life, as a good story should. And so this is why I say that Dorothy gave Spock his soul. Between Journey to Babel, Yesteryear, and everything else that Dor Dorothy contributed to Star Trek, her treatment of Vulcans really shines above anyone else that have ever written for Vulcans, ever. So thank you, Dorothy. Star Trek would not be what it is today without you.